So, are you punked in drugs? Punk fairy. It's a quick fairy. Yeah. Um, I think I know what you mean. When you say f of x, you're multiplying that, right? Oh no, we're you evaluating. Just... We're evaluating it. So, um, let me just do an example off the side. So, for instance, if I do f of x equals say x plus one, right? Suppose that's my function. Then f of x means that this is a function f, and it takes a variable x. So you can think of f as like a machine. Right, so you got a little, it's like a little black box. And what you're doing is you're plugging in a variable x and the function is popping out a new thing, a new, in this case, a new number based on x. So the little box will pop you back out x plus one. So for instance, if I take two and I plug two into the box, right? It gives me what? Two. Or no, Careful. three, I'm sorry. Three, yeah, yeah, yeah. It gives me three, right? If I plug in three in the box, it gives me four. So when I say f of x, or in this case, like f of two, all I'm saying that. is I'm plugging it into the function. Does that make okay, sense? Yeah, I, I get it now. I okay. just, I think it was the wording I wasn't getting at first. Yeah, that's okay. You know, that's a lot of what this is. There's just notation to get around. Um, uh, yeah. Any other questions about function notation? And again, this is called evaluating. So this is F, you can say it also as F evaluated at two. So you're or F or, or uh, plugging in, plugging in X equals two. So there's a lot of ways you can say it. F at two, uh, F evaluated at two, plugging in X equals two into F. It, <laughs> there's a lot of ways, but it all means the same thing. You're just kind of using the function. All right, so yeah, feel free to stop me if you ever have any questions. We can always take tangents. Uh, it's never a problem. Uh, let's see, so anyway, a function's growth is how much it changes as the input increases. So basically, again, when we talk about the behavior of function and when we talk about a function increasing and a function decreasing, we're talking about it increasing or decreasing as you move from left to right. So it's, it's the same way that you read, right? So for instance, in this one we did yesterday, this function decreases as you go from left to right, because the function's going down, right? The y values are decreasing. Um, uh, and in general, I'll say that the function's growth is how much the input, or the, it, how much it changes as the input increases, right? So for example, if we look at this first one here, just very generally, as x increases, how does this function grow? It multiplies it by two. Yeah. So as x gets bigger, what is going to happen to the function? What is it going to do? Double. Increases. Yep, it's going to increase. Yep. Oops, my pun. So as x increases, and again, by increases, all you mean is going left to right, on, if you're thinking of it graphically. So as x increases, f of x increases. All right? And you can be as kind of uh, explicit or as kind of abstract as you like. It, right, for, for now, this is all I'm really talking about. I'm just saying that the function is increasing, um, the growth, the behavior is going up, right? Uh, if you wanted to, though, like, like uh, the one person said, you, you could talk about how much it's increasing. So if you wanted to, you could even make a little table, right? And remember x and y, uh, y, if it's not set, is usually taken to be f of x. So my y equals f of x. And here f of x is 2x plus 1. So if I want to make a little chart of coordinates uh, on my function, then I can just plug in some random numbers. So maybe I'll do uh, 0, 1, and 2. Just I'm not going to graph it. I just want to see how the y values are changing. So and again, this is just we're just kind of roughly talking about how the function's growing. Nothing, there's no right or wrong, wrong answers for this kind of problem. Um, so I plug in 0, and what do I get? One. Yep. I plug in one. What do I get? Three. Three. Mm -hmm. And finally, two. Five. Nice. All right. And so, if you're looking at this function kind of very explicitly, you can see that every time you your your x coordinate goes up by one, your y coordinate goes up by two. All right. So that's kind of cool. So your 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 growth, your your kind of 
your function's behavior as x is increasing is that you keep adding two each time, right? Now let's look at this one down here. This is gonna be a completely different kind of function. As x increases, do we have any guesses as to what this function does? Does it increase or decrease? Can't see what's next to the two. Oh, it's a two x, sorry. Y equals two x. Two to the x. Increases. It's what, it increases? Yes, right? So for instance, if I were to make another table for this one, and again, uh, my f of x is equal to y here, where again, f of x is just the notation for the function. Uh, then, so if I plug in zero, I'll do the same ones. I'll do zero, one, two, and maybe I'll do three this time. What do I get when I plug in zero? One, are you holding up your finger for one to mean one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like it. Good. Yeah, so do, remember our exponential rules. We'll be using them kind of periodically throughout the semester. But so this is two to the zero. And anything to the zero is always one. Although I think some people define zero to the zero. I think it's often defined as one, but it's it's up to the to the to the person writing it. So but everything else is always is always one here. So one to the zero is one. 204 to the zero is one, doesn't matter. All right, and what about two to the one? What is that gonna be? Two. Yep, All right. Two to the two? Four. Yep, and again, so the way you're doing this is it's just, you're writing, you're multiplying two by itself twice. So it's two times two, which is four. For two to the one, you're writing two times itself once. So it's just two. And you can kind of think of it for zero too. You're writing two times itself zero times. So it's, it's one. Uh, and then three, of course, is what? Six. Careful. So it's going to be, you're writing this one, two to the three, right? So it's two times itself three times. So it's going to be two times itself again, and then times itself once more. So, so two so times two is four, mm -hmm. four times two is eight. There you go. Yep. So it's, uh, it's, it's exponential, or it's exponential growth, not uh, just multiplication. Anyway, so you make this, and you obviously can keep going if you like, but uh, this is sufficient for us. And as you can see, it does increase. So, so we, over here, we could write as x increases, uh, f of x increases. You, yeah? Two to, like, two to the three is the same as saying two to the third power, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. that's how I learned in high school. Yep, two to the third power. Uh, if you're using a calculator, like if you're using eek, one of these, like TI-83s, it's going to be this caret button right there. So you'd write 2 caret 3, if you can kind of see that. And that will give you the exponent. Uh, some scientific calculators will just have the exponential, so we'll have like 2 to the x, and you have to figure out how to use your own calculator. But also, just know it's a caret. Uh, Alrighty. Anyway, so now uh, in the first one up here, we noted that the y values increased by two, right? So these increase by two. But if we look at these values, what is the diff what is the difference between two and one? One. Okay. So I'll put this off to the side. What about four and two? Two. Mm-hmm. And then finally four eight and four? Four. Yeah. So it's different, right? So all of these ones in this example above are increasing just by two, but down here, the, the, the rate, the, the numbers at which they're increasing by is different, like they're changing. Um, I'm not just growing by two each time, I'm growing by one, two, four. If I did the next one, I'd not be growing by eight, and then 16, and 32, and 64, and so on and so forth. So, uh, whereas up here, if you keep doing it, you'll only ever increase by two. So, uh, as, as we'll see, uh, in the next few pages, this is an example of what's called linear growth because it grows by the same absolute value or the absolute number each time. Whereas down here, this is called exponential growth because it's growing by some per, some relative value. Right? We'll get into that in a sec. Any questions? Oh, do those just keep doubling? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If it was 3 to the x2, they would keep tripling and so on and so forth. Yeah. Anything else? Alrighty, 
so as I said, um, so we say that F has linear growth if it grows by the same absolute amount for every unit we increase the input by. So this is linear growth. Right. So that first example we did where it increased by, increased by two each time is an example of linear growth because it is constant. It's, you're only adding two every time you increase the x value. Uh, and again, that's in contrast to that second example where the values change for every x value. Right. And then this is just a, another example like the one we just did. So if you had to guess, what would this function be increasing by? Four. Four, exactly. So this increases by, it increases by four. Um, every time we increase uh, x by one, right? and if you weren't, if you're not convinced of that, you can just make a table and compute yourself how many times or how many uh, units the y value increases for every x value increase. Right, but you'll see it's just four, and you can see that kind of uh, straight away too, right? So if you ignore this minus one for a minute. Every time I increase the x value, I just get another copy of four. And so that, that's literally where it comes from. Yeah. All right. And then the second, the second thing here is just kind of fun, I guess. I don't know. Um, <laughs> suppose you plant a magic turnip in October. Every month you keep the turnip in the ground, it gains four ounces in weight. Uh, write a function to describe the weight of this turnip, turnip in terms of months. Seems pretty, pretty standard. I can't grow turnips. But I suppose if it was magic, I could. Um, I also don't know the growing season for turnips. I don't think it's October. If you grow turnips, you can correct me. Alrighty. So any any ideas how we can start with this? Right. The goal is to just write a function to describe the weight. So we haven't done a lot of, like writing functions uh, on our own yet. So what you usually want to do is you want to first write your variables. So here, what are our variables going to be? Well, weight could be W. Yep. What about the other one? And then M for months, yep. right? M exactly. Yep. You, for time, you can do T, or in this case, it's, it's months, so I'll do M. All right. So we have our two variables, and we want to write a function. So we want to describe a relationship between them. So uh, the next thing we should probably do is identify which we want to be our independent and which we want to be our dependent variable. So which is going to be our independent variable? Four ounces. Uh, careful. So the, the independent and the dependent variable have to be one of our variables, right? And so the four ounces is going to be important in a minute, but we only have two, our only variables are the weight and the months. So the uh, weight would be the dependent variable. Exactly, yeah. And you can also see that by the, the, the way it's written, right? So you'll know it says, describe the weight in terms of months. So in terms of is kind of saying, I want you to determine the weight when I plug in the months. Does that make sense? So uh, the, the language kind of gives it away. So this- So uh, the weight depends on the months. Exactly, yep. So the weight is going to be the dependent. And this is going to be the months will be independent. And now we, we can kind of figure out what we want. So we want the weight to depend on the months. So what that means is I can write a function, say W of M, right? And so W is uh, my weight. And you can even, if you want, you'll often sometimes see this. So uh, a lot of times you, some people will hide the, the, the function part of it and just say, oh, the variable equals the weight in terms of you know, kind of, it's kind of an abuse of notation. This is a variable. This is a function. It works out in the end. Um, and anyway, so what's, what's our function going to be? What's the relationship? Four so, ounces. Four ounces is part of it, right? So we have four. So then if, if we're in the ground one month, what's our weight going to be? Four yeah. ounces. All right. If we're in the ground two months, what's our weight going to be? Eight ounces. Three months? Twelve. 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 Yeah. So what can you see a pattern? What's the formula for that? You're adding four ounces each time. Four? Yeah, you're adding four. So four. so for 
What was that? Would it be plus four? Yeah, it's gonna be, you're just gonna keep adding four, right? Uh, and so the way you can describe that is just to write four times M, right? And you can do that, you could have made a chart too. So like I was doing, if you have um, the months and the weight, and so what did we do? We did one month, we were four, two months, we were eight, three months, we were 12. And you could do more, you could do four months is 16. And as you observed, you just keep adding four, but the, it's, kind of, it's kind of like a backwards little puzzle. Like you just have to figure out a formula for these numbers and you'll say, oh, if I multiply four times the months, I get exactly the weight, right? And there you go. And so that's my, that's my function, just four times M. Right. So any, any issues with that? So it's a, it's a good example because you, it kind of goes, goes through the steps of, of writing a function. And this is more things we'll be doing all semester, essentially. Um, and so it's, it's kind of good to, to make sure you understand this example in particular. So just know how to interpret a, a word problem like this. You know, so this word problem gives you some things that you're studying, essentially. It gives you two variables. You have to first define what the variables are to determine which one is the dependent and independent. And then you have to kind of find a, a relationship between them and define a function on your own. Okay. All right, so that's that. Let's look at one more. And then we'll get into the next notes. So this is an, this is an example called the magic penny. All right. So let me describe the example. And it's going to be kind of a similar process. I'm going to basically describe a word problem. And then we're going to try to find a function that models it. All right. All right, so here's the situation. So you have, almost like the magic turnip, you have one penny, right? Penny. And it's a magic penny. And so at the first day you have one of them, right? You say you put it in your pocket and the next day you, you go and check your pocket and there's two. They, the, the penny split and made two pennies. Right? And that's basically the idea. Every day, every, every day, each of the pennies split and you get two more, all right? So day one, I had one. Day two, I had two. So day four or day three, you'd have four? Yeah, exactly. Because this one splits and then this one splits. So this is day three, all right? And we'll just do a couple more. How many will I have in day four? Eight. Yep. And I'm, my pennies are getting smaller because I'm running out of room. <laughs> But it just keeps splitting. And so this is day four. And so I'll, maybe I'll put a count on here. So day one, I have one. Day two, I have two. Day three, I have four. And day four, I have eight. And you can keep going. You can kind of see the pattern. Um, but you know, you're going to have a lot of pennies. <laughs> so can anyone, uh, well, I guess we, let's do it the same way. Let's define our variables. So we want to find a relationship between the day and the number of pennies we have. So basically, I want a function that I can plug in the day and it will pop out how many pennies I get, right? So uh, what should our variables be called? D for day, P for penny. I like it. So D is day, day number, and P is number of pennies. All right. So based on the, the few data points we have, can we guess a uh, function that will give me the number of pennies when I plug in the day? So for instance, I want P equals P of D, and I want to plug in the number of days and for it to pop out the number of pennies I'm gonna have. P2. What was that? P times two. P times two, that's a good guess. And you're really close, actually. So if you do P times two, right? we can check to see if it works. So um, on day two, or on day one, I'd have two pennies. So it doesn't quite match on day one. We can see if it works and it's just like a, an indexing issue. So if I plug in two, it, I get four. So I'm kind of somewhere. If I plug in three, though, I have six. And on no days do I have six pennies. What else can I do though? So it's kind of similar Wear to- it. Huh? Square it. Square it. Square the number of days. You're you're getting you're almost in the same rate. You're in the same. You're getting close. 
<laughs> so if I square it, let's see, one times one is one. So that's actually perfect. Two times two is four though. Uh, three times three is nine. So it doesn't quite match up there. But what if you switch it? So instead of doing D squared, what if I do two to the D, right? So I mean, let's try it. Because this is just like that example I did earlier. Uh, on this sheet, on page six, right? We were playing around with the function two to the x, and we saw this kind of behavior one, two, four, eight, this doubling. And that's, that's exactly what I was thinking of. I just don't know how to word it. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Good, good, good. All right. Um, and let's check, right? So if I plug in d equals one into this, what do I get? I get two. If I plug in two into this, into two to the d, I get four. If I plug in three into two to the d, I get eight. So it's, it's, it's the right pattern, right? We have the right number of pennies popping out. The only problem is that our indexes is, are wrong. When, but by index, I mean that it's just kind of like shifted. So what I need to do is put a minus one there, All right? And the only reason I'm doing that is so that it kind of fits the data. So like I want it to be that when I plug in D equals one, I get one penny and I can check. When I do that, I get, so if I, let's, let's check it. So I'll make a little table here. Uh, D and then P, if I plug in zero, one, two, three, four. Oh, sorry, no zero. If I plug in one, two, three, four, let's see. So I get, when I plug in one, I get two to the one minus one, which is two to the zero. And as I said, that's one, so we're good. And then two, I get two to the two minus one, which is two to the one, which is just two. All right, and so that's-, Are that's you yeah. You've got to do it like this because you started with one penny. Yeah. Because yeah. if you started with two pennies, you wouldn't need the minus one, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, it's just like a, you're just kind of shifting things to kind of work out in the wording of the problem. Um, the other way you could have done it, uh, let me just finish so, this. It, I'm sorry. You, yeah. If you started with three pennies, mm -hmm. it would just be a minus three or a minus three. If you started with three pennies, so then that would mean day one had three. I don't know. <laughs> then you'd have, because if you, you'll notice three is kind of an odd choice because there's no, you'd never have three pennies here. So I think that's going to be a slightly different formula, actually. Okay. The reason I was asking is I was wondering versus odds versus evens. Yeah. Correction. Yeah, it's, it's going to be- Maybe a, I'm just thinking too far ahead. <laughs> no, you're good. It's good to always think of different uh, exceptions and different, you know, how would you twist this or generalize it. Um, but yeah, so three would be a slightly different formula. But if you multiply, if you started on any, if you started on any power of two, it would be somewhere in here and the formula would be similar to this. It's just that if you start on a, not a power of two, it's not going to work the same way. It'll still work, but it'll just be a different formula. Um, I'm sorry, the other thing I was going to say, you could also have just said that this was day zero, this was day one, two, and three. So it's just how you label it, really. So um, that's the other important thing when you're talking about functions and when you're setting them up on your own, is that you have to be kind of careful and precise on what your variables are, where they start. Uh, and this kind of leads us into the domain and range thing. So for instance, on this function here, my domain, uh, maybe I'll put it down here, my domain for this function, and that's all the values that I can plug into it. The domain, the way I set it up, it'd be one, two, three, four, and so on and so forth. So it'd be, um, I'll, I don't know how I'll write it. I'll write it like a set, I guess. I'll just put one, two, three, four, and so on and so forth. All right. But again, as I said, you could have started at zero. And in that case, your domain would be zero, one, two, three, and so on and so forth. So uh, it's a little bit, kind of a technical point, but uh, any questions about this, this example? All right. If, if you yeah. don't put that P in front of the P um, with the D, you know, does oh, that yeah, like, like, like count that? as wrong? Yeah. yeah. Does that yeah, count no, as wrong? You don't need that there if you don't want it. The only reason I put it there was so that, because I didn't, I, you could, it's kind of like an abusive notation. Like this P is kind of, is really a function in terms of D, the days. 
but it also represents the number of pennies. So I would never mark it wrong if you did this one or this one and not both. As long as you have one of them, you're good. Yeah. Anything else? All right. So that's the end of the notes from Tuesday. But I did post more. And I'm sorry I didn't post them earlier. Uh, I posted them this morning just before. I, was supposed, I intended to put them last night. I didn't get to it. I had a house inspection that went to like 9 o'clock. Um, but all right. So uh, again, we're just kind of continuing uh, in this these notes. So as you said, it's, as I say, it's 3.1 continued. And then we're going to start 3.2. All right. So, and this, it just goes right from the other notes. So uh, we say F has exponential growth if it grows by the same relative amount. So exponential. Right. And so these examples that we've done where we've looked at functions two to the X or two to the D minus one, they're, those are exponential functions. Because if we go back to page six here, you'll, it's kind of, and this, when we do percentages later on in the semester, uh, you'll, you, this might make a little more sense if your percentages are a little uh, stale, but <laughs> you can see that, so like look, th this, it grows by one here, right? And then it grows by two, and then it grows by four. And then as I said, the next one grows by eight. And if you look, you'll see that if it, grow, it grows by one after the functions one, and then it goes by two after the functions two, and then four, four, eight, and eight. So like there's this relationship between the amount that the function grows and the value that the function just was. So the function you can think of this is essentially growing by 100% of the function itself. So um, be if between f of zero and f of one, this function grows by one, between one and two, this function grows by two. And so basically you're adding the function onto itself to make it grow. And so it, it's, it's like a relative growth rate, all right? And again, when we talk about percentages, we'll kind of revisit this, um, but just know it's relative to the function. And if you look at this one here, this one's always growing by two, it's a line. So if you consider two as uh, like a, a percentage of the function, two is what, twice one, but then two is only uh, a, a fraction of three, and then two is less than a half of five. So relative to the function itself, it's growing by a smaller and smaller amount each time, if that makes sense, I don't know. but it's okay. Right, for now, we just wanna kind of understand that linear growth is growing by the same amount, the same absolute amount each time, but exponential changes grows by a different amount. It grows by a relative amount, right? So, as I said, does 2 to the x of exponential growth? Yes. And we showed that in the other, in the other example I was just talking about. So see example two on page six. In notes one. <laughs> a lot of, uh, lot of things there. All right, so we have linear of an exponential. And, ooh, Wendy. As an example, another example of exponential, uh, I want to talk about bacteria in a bottle. And this is going to seem similar to the penny example, but I'm, we're going to look at it from a different kind of point of view, right? So the bacteria in the bottle is, as I said, it's similar to the penny. Basically, the idea here is that I have this bottle, as the name goes, I have this bottle, and let me kind of draw a little picture. Boop, that's the lid. And there's my bottle. It's not a very good looking bottle, but it's uh, a bottle. And in the bottle, there are bacteria. Boop, 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 boop. I don't know what bacteria really look like, but well, in my I'm bottle, still... they look like fireflies. All right? So we have bacteria in my bottle. And the idea is that every minute, every minute, every bacteria in the bottle splits in two. Every bacteria in the bottle, oops, oh yeah, it's fine, splits in two, all right? So they split in two and you get two new bacteria and you get two new bacteria. 
with me. So again, it's just like the penny, except we have bacteria. And now the idea, and, and the idea here is that they're kind of confined in this bottle, right? So, um, the bo and, oh, and the other thing we'll need too is the bottle, suppose, suppose the bottle is full at 12 o'clock. Okay. All right, so again, the setup, it's a little weird. I, suppose, it's, I think it's like something you'd be like in a, like in a chemistry lab or a biology lab, right? And you have like this growing bacteria in this glass bottle and it keeps replicating and growing. It's like a little ecosystem, all right? And eventually at 12 o'clock, the bottle is entirely full. So the bacteria cannot reproduce anymore because if they did, there'd be no room in the bottle for them, I guess they're like spawn, all right? So the question is, if the bottle is full at 12 o'clock, when is it half full? Six. So this is, this is the interesting part with exponential growth. If the bacteria were growing at a linear, with linear growth, so if they were growing by the same exact amount every minute, then it would be six. But they're doubling every minute, right? So if it's- so It'd be the minute before this, it'd be 11.59. Exactly, yeah. It's exactly one minute, one, exactly one minute before. minute before, right? And if you think about it, you can think about it in the sense that, so you have, you have this bottle and it's entirely full of bacteria. And if you think about one minute before, then you, they basically take every two bacteria in that bottle at 12 and kind of smush them together, right? So every two bacteria, when you kind of go back in time one minute became one bacteria. And so you've exactly half as many bacteria in the bottle, assuming it's an even number of bacteria, which we can assume. All right, any, does that make sense? Any questions? So you're just kind of, you're so thinking, we're going back in time, yeah? So at 11.58, it'd be a quarter full. 11.57, an eighth full, kind of like a half life. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's what the second part gets at. You cut, yeah, exactly. So, um, so at 12 o'clock, 12 sharp, it's uh, entirely full which I'll just call one. And then as he said, what you do to figure out how empty the bottle was at 1156, you just go back in time. So uh, 1159, it was half full. We go back time one more minute and you just keep dividing it in half just by the same kind of operation, right? So you take every time you go back a minute, all those two bacteria kind of smush together and you get one. So the next minute I get a four because it's a half of a half. And then you do uh, another time. So 1157, I get a half of a fourth. So if, if your fractions aren't good. Um, one sixteenth full. Yep, yeah, exactly. That's what your final answer should be. So and then one more time, as he said, to get 1156, you get one sixteenth. Right, so you just keep dividing it by two. You take a half of everything. So you start with one divided by two to get a, 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 a half. You divide a half by two to get a fourth. You divide a fourth by two to get an eighth. And you divide an eighth by two to get a sixteenth. Right? Um, and just to be clear about the fraction business, uh, let me kind of move this off. If, um, so like if I have one half and I divide it by two, Right, so if you've forgotten how to do some fractions, it's just a matter of keep, change, flip, right? So the way you can interpret this is, I'm really dividing by two fractions. So two is equal to two over one. And so you do keep, change, flip. It sounds like, I don't know, like a huge storm is coming. Um, so you keep the top, you change the division to multiplication and you flip the denominator. And then to multiply fractions, you just multiply the numerators across and the denominators across. So this is equal to one times one over two times two, which is one four. All right. And you just keep doing that for the, that's how we got the rest. So like the one eighth, I'll just do one eighth for you as well. So you get one fourth and I divide that by two. And so I just do the same keep change flip. So this is, as I said, two over one. And I do keep, keep the top the same, one fourth change the division to multiplication. 
and then flip the denominator to one half. And then you just multiply the numerators, which is the tops, and the denominators, which are the bottoms. So I get one times one over four times two, which is one eighth. All right, and you just keep doing that. So. I did not learn it that way, and I wish my teacher would have taught me that way. Oh, <laughs> I thought everyone learned keep change flip. Oh, no. <laughs> That's good. All right, any questions? Awesome. All right, so that's the end of 3.1. So the whole premise of 3.1 really is I, we just, I just wanted to A, set down some notation as far as functions go. So make sure you're kind of comfortable with independent, dependent variables, comfortable with sketching or graphing or at least plotting some simple-ish functions. Um, and then I just wanted to introduce linear and exponential growth. So now what we're gonna do in 3.2 uh, is we are going to get a little deeper into linear functions, and then the next section will get a little deeper into uh, exponential functions. And exponential, I think, are the, are the harder ones, really, um, especially because most people have seen linear functions in high school at some point in their lives. Um, but yeah, so a linear function. Linear function is a function of the form. So uh, again, most of you have seen this, right? But it's just mx plus b. Okay. Uh, the graph of a linear function is a what? Straight line. line. It's a line, exactly. All right. What is m? Anyone? Slope, right? And we'll talk more about slope and how to find it. Uh, and then B is called the y-intercept. All right, so I'm, let's, I want to explain in particular what the y-intercept is. Uh, but yeah, let's just do that by an example. All right, so the first step is I want to graph this function. So let's just do that, and then we'll talk about what these things mean. So how should I do it? I'm going to put it right in the middle. And I'm using a pen. And as I said, never use a pen when you're doing when you're graphing things, but I just, you know, I like to live on the edge, apparently. It's uh, easier to depend too. Huh? It's easier to see. It is, exactly. Yeah, it's true. Um, so uh, you can plot, as I said before, if you're plotting a line, you only need to do two points and then connect the dots, and that, that's it. Two points determine a line. So um, I'll just plug in zero. I'll make a little table off to the side here. I'm just going to plug in x equals zero, and then I'll plug in one. And you can do more if you like, but as I said, it won't matter. Um, so I plug in zero, and again, my y is just my f of x, right? And I should label my axes too. Again, x goes on the horizontal, y goes on the vertical, uh, and you can, you can, you can put some dots on here. Um, you know what I mean? Like I can put one, two, three, four four, yada, yada, one, two, three, four, so on and so forth, right? Uh, so if I plug in zero, I get what? Zero. I, I heard, I think I heard one. I'm going to take it. I get one, right? So I plug in f of zero, and so it's going to be, I'm kind of running out of space on the side here, but it's going to be three times zero plus one. Three times zero, of course, is zero. So then you get zero plus one, which is one. All right, sorry, it's a little cramped. And then at one, I'll put one down here maybe. I get three times one plus one. So that's just what? Four. Yep. So at zero, I get one. So I go to zero, which is again, always at the origin. So zero on the x, and then I go up to one on the y and put a dot there. And then for the next point, I have one, and then the y at one is four. So I go to x equals one and go up to four and put a dot there, All right? And as I said, you can do more points, but if you set up your uh, grid correctly, it won't matter how many more points you do, you'll always get the same line. Like, it's just gonna be a straight line as defined by the two points. So if I have a straight edge, uh, which I don't, oh, I have a box of staples, that will work. Um, I'll use a straight edge to make it somewhat nicer. There you go. All right, so that's my function. Sometimes I put arrows. I don't know why people put arrows, 
but it, I feel like it looks incomplete without the arrows, so I'm, I put arrow. Um, I think it just means to say it goes off in infinity in both directions, but it's not important. Uh, oh, and I do like you to label your function, so always label your function. At least just put f of x, but if you like, if you have room, you can put the whole function there too. All right, so that that's a nice graph. All right, so uh, now the y-intercept I think is easier to explain. So what is the y-intercept? Anyone know? Where it meets on the y-axis. Exactly. It's exactly what it says. Um, it's where the, the function intercepts the y or where it meets the y-axis. So if this is my function and this is the y-axis, then they intersect right at one, right? And so my y-intercept in this case is one, which is also b, you'll note. All right, and so again, it's just where where your function meets uh, slash intersects the y-axis. Right. So the y-intercept is, uh, is, is something you can talk about for any function. It doesn't have to just be lines. It can be exponential functions. If you go on and take, I don't know if we do, we do trig. No, we don't. This some, we don't do trig. But if you do take like a trig class or like a calc class, um, trig functions have y-intercepts. Any function you want can theoretically have a y-intercept. Now, some functions will have a y-intercept that doesn't exist just because the function won't exist at zero, and so it will never hit the y-axis. But um, just, just note that the y-intercept is something you can talk about for any function, not just lines. Uh, slope, on the other hand, is something in our context that you can really only talk about for lines. So uh, what's the slope going to be? In this, in this Rise function. Over yeah. So in this function in particular, right, if we go back and just work on this form mx plus b and look at our function here, then my m must be 3 and my b must be the 1, like I said. So my m is just going to be 3 here. And as she said, it's the way you can interpret it is rise over run. And I think I'm doing more with the slope later, but. Uh, I'll just include it here for complete, uh, complete rise over run. So the slope would just be for like every movement on X, how far it goes up Y. Exactly, exactly. So like here, for instance, I go over one unit on the X, right? So like, boop, boop, boop. And when I do that, I end up going up three on the Y. And so my- so at at two, you'd be at seven on the Y. Exactly, yep, yep. Uh, and so the, the rise over run business comes from the, this being the rise. And my picture is kind of tiny, but this little gap here where it goes over on the X is called the run. So as I said, I think I have another more on this on the next two sheets. So we'll kind of be covered again, but um, that's, a, that's the graphical interpretation. Uh, it's gonna be how much you go up for every one you go over on the X, right? Or down. This actually so, works when you're building stairs. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> I've never built stairs. I'm assuming it's somewhat difficult. Um, what was I gonna say? I forget what I was gonna say. But yeah, any, any other questions about this little example? Awesome. All right. So, oh yeah, I guess this is what I was saying. So if the slope is positive, the function is increasing, right? So again, if the slope is the rise over run and the slope is positive, then every time I go over one on the X, I'm going up some positive number on the Y. And so necessarily my function is increasing. Does that make sense? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and then my slope is negative if it's decreasing. And that also makes sense, right? So if my slope is negative, then that means that every time I go over one on the X, I go down, I go some negative amount on the Y. And so graphically, you'll interpret that as a downward line, or as I said, it, the slope for our purposes is really only defined for lines. But if you do want to take something like calculus, or even at the end of pre-calc, um, you can talk about the slope or the rate of change for any function. But 
it's a little more complicated. Um, and then the slope is constant. Uh, then the function is a horizontal line. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> zero. I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, if it's constant, then it's a line. Uh, if the slope is zero, then the function is a horizontal line. Sorry. That's what I thought it was supposed to be. <laughs> I was like, uh. Yeah, yeah, always yell at me if something happens. <laughs> All right, so let's just go through these uh, a couple examples here and, and try to classify them. So the first one is y equals 9. So what's the slope here going to be for y equals 9? Horizontal. Huh? Yeah, it's going to be, hor be horizontal, right? Uh, and so you can see that either by looking at the graph. So I won't grab all of these, but this one's really quick, the graph, right? Because the, the y is just identically 9. So regardless of what uh, x value, I plug into it, it, it's just nine. So on my graph, it's just going to be a flat line like that. And you can plot more points, obviously, but it's, they're all just nine. So then you connect the dots and you're good to go. Um, so this one's a horizontal line. So the slope equals zero, horizontal line. All right. Uh, the other way you can see that algebraically is if I kind of rewrite it. Uh, and so what I can do, if you're, if you're more into algebraic kind of solutions, I can write y equals 9. And then if the slope is 9, I can kind of just insert the 0 times x. So it's going to be 9 plus 0 times x. Or if you want to get it into mx plus b form, it's 0 times x plus 9, right? And then so this is my m, and this is my b in y equals mx plus b form, right? So a couple of different ways to do it, either graph it or do it algebraically, it's good to go. All right, now the next one, what about this one? Is this one, increasing. it's increasing, right? Because again, the easiest way to do these is just kind of uh, identify the terms with the form y equals mx plus b. So again, it's already kind of in that form. So this is my m, the four, and the t negative two is my b. So um, let me rewrite this actually. So this is 4x plus <laughs> minus 2. And so the 4 is my m, as I said, and then minus 2 is my b, right? Uh, and so it's increasing. Any questions with that one? And so do it, just the thing to be careful with with a function like this, too, and it's not related to the increase and decreasing part, but if I had asked you for the y-intercept, you might have been tempted just to say 2. And you have to be careful because you have to kind of incorporate the negative into the intercept as well. So you, when you're writing it as y equals mx plus b, then you kind of have to identify this whole thing as the, the b, the plus and minus 2. All right. All right. Uh, and we can do the same thing for the next one. In this case, it's even simpler because there's nothing tricky to rewrite. So my m here is minus 8. It's negative. So it's decreasing. All right. So any questions with those first three? We're just kind of identifying functions uh, with this kind of standard mx plus b form. Um, now, this next one's a trick question. It's vertical. It's vertical. Yeah, you're on, you're on, you're on your game. Uh, <laughs> so this is one. And so if I were to graph this, right? Uh, it's, it's kind of weird. And so this doesn't fit the format of what I defined a linear function to be at all, right? Because there's no y, it's just x. And in, in this format, I, I'm saying there has to be a y term. And so strictly speaking, this is not a linear function under my definition. It would just be a point. Um, so that's the tricky part, right? So what it, it's doing, it's an equation for sure, right? And it certainly defines some number of points in the plane, but it defines infinitely many. And so what happens is basically there's no condition on y. There's no condition on y, right? So what that, what that tells you is that y can be anything, but x has to be one. And so basically it can be, it can be x equals one, y equals zero. It can be x equals 1, y equals 1, x equals 1, y equals 2, and so on and so forth, or negative 1 for y, or negative 2 for y, 
as long as x equals one, there's no condition on y. And so it's, an, it's a vertical line like that, right? Um, and so uh, if, again, if you take like a pre-calc course or a calc course, this is considered a line, um, but the problem is it's not a function uh, because it doesn't pass the vertical line test, if you remember that from high school. Um, yeah, so it's just kind of a little technical point. It's kind of cute. Uh, it's a vertical line. It's not a linear function. It's not even a function. Um, but that's what the graph would be if you were to graph it. All right. Questions, concerns, issues? All right, good. All right. All right, so now, so we've defined functions, right? I've given you the form y equals mx plus b. Uh, and now, and we did a couple of examples graphing them and determining when they're increasing, decreasing based on the slope and the y-intercept. But now we want to do some more algebraic kind of manipulation with them. And this is getting more into the slope and how do we compute it. So, so given two points on a line, f, uh, and these are my two points, x naught, y naught, x1, y1. And I, x naught and y naught, naught just means sub zero. So the sub index of zero is often called naught. Um, so we can compute the slope as, so m equals. So uh, like we talked about earlier, it's really rise over run. But in terms of explicit points here, it's going to be, this will be y1 minus the rise, so it's y naught, and then over the run, so it's x1 minus x naught. Right? Uh, and oftentimes, if you, uh, if, you, if you're reading other sources, I think the book too, you'll see this written as delta y over delta x. So if, you, if, you, if you're Googling things about slope or if you're reading the book or other sources, you might see this. And all it means is this is the change in y over the change in x. That's what the delta means. The delta can, you, can essentially read as change in for our purposes. Right. It's not terribly important. The important part for us is the rise of run and then this definition there. Right. So uh, let's, let's try this example to see how this goes. So find the slope of a line through the points 1, 1, and 2, 3. And I always like to graph. I always like to make a little plot off the side. It's not super necessary, but it, it makes me feel better. Um, so I'll plot the points. So I'll put, uh, I'll just do 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, whoop, 3. And I'll leave my x, my y axes. And I'll just plot them. So I have a question. One, yeah. So my teacher taught me for the rise and run, I, they did y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Is that the same thing or? It's the same thing, yeah. Yeah. It's just okay, different. just, it's just different. Sure. Yeah, it's just different indexes. So the, the numbers are just different, but it's the same. Like the x2 minus x, or y2 minus y1, it doesn't matter, yeah. Whatever notation you're comfortable with is okay with me. Okay. Um, so let's just find the slope. Oh, and we can, let me draw this line again, my handy dandy box of staples. So, uh, yeah. Does it go through the origin? It doesn't matter. Whatever, I'll fudge it. There you go. Looks something like that. Sometimes my graphs aren't very accurate, so it ends up going through the origin, but my graph doesn't look like it, so I don't like it, but we'll see. <laughs> so let's just compute the slope, as I said. Oh, and so the, the important part is that you take x naught y naught or x1 y1 if that, and then the two for the other one, if that's your notation, you take it to be the left point. So that's gonna be here, uh, x naught y naught. And then the rightmost point will be the second point, the, the one or the two. So it's gonna be x1 y1, right? And so this one was one one. And the second one here was two, three. Is that okay? Sorry, I made it a little small. I didn't anticipate labeling it so much. Uh, any questions with the setup? So again, you want this one to be the rightmost point. And then this one, I guess it doesn't really matter. If you switch the order, it will just negate them both. Doesn't matter. I'll, I'll, in general, I'll take it to be this though. So I'll take, I'll usually take this one to be the right, this one to be the left. Um, 
But if you do switch them, yeah, it just negates the top and the bottom, so it doesn't matter. But anyway, uh, to be consistent. So uh, let's see. So as I said, it's y1 minus y0 over x1 minus x0. And I've already identified them on my graph here. So y1 was 3, uh, y0 was 1, x0 was, or x1 was 2, and then x0 was 1. And then you just compute it. So here, what do I get? I get 2 over 1, which is 2. All right. And we can kind of check, right, and see that, that let me get a different color pen. Maybe this will work. Nope. Uh, let's see. Where's my pen? Oh, hey, this is work. Right. So, uh, so what this means is that every one I go over, so like if I go over one here, then I go up two. So again, you go over one, you go up two. Um, that's all riser run is. Any questions with that? All right. So again, most people have seen this. But if not, it's all good. Feel free to ask more questions. Um, let's try a, a more practical example. So this one involves the population of a city, which is something that I think the first project we'll do will be based on. Um, populations of cities or states or whatever. Um, but we'll get there at the end of the material. Uh, so the population of a city increased from 10,000 to 20,000 over five years. Find the rate of change during this time span. And I think we'll end with this example. Uh, so, so what I want to do is you have to identify, uh, you have to kind of set it up, right? Because it's given as a, a word problem and not, the variables aren't really there. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, I'm going to plot it. So I'm going to say, I'm going to let P be the population. And I'm going to let T be the number of years. All right. And I don't know what year it started. It doesn't give me any dates. So I'm just going to say, uh, this is year zero. So, so P of zero equals 10,000, one, two, three. And then five years later, one, two, three, four, five. Does that work? That should work. Yeah. So then P of five will be 22, one, two. Right. Does that make sense? My setup so far? Right. And then from here, it, once I set it up like this, then it's kind of more similar to the previous example, right? Um, I can graph it as points. So for instance, when I plug in zero, I get 10,000. So if I had a little, make a little graph like this at zero, I'll be up here at like 10,000. And then at five, I'll be like up here at 20, two, one, two, like that somewhere. All right, where this is T, and then on the vertical, I have P. All right. And again, if you want, you can connect the dots a little bit. All right. And so what I want is I want to just find the rise or run for this. I'll be good to go. So, um, so again, I'll take this to my, sec my, first, my second point. So this is... Uh, x1, y1, and then this will be x0, y0. And now we just plug it in. So, so m equals y1 minus y0 over x0, or x1 minus x0. And the numbers for this one won't be pretty, uh, but it's okay. So it's 20, 2, 1, 2 over minus 10, 1, 2, 3. That's y1, y0 and then minus five minus zero. And so my handy any calculator, two, zero, two, one, two, minus 10, one, two, three, divide by five. So it looks like you get 189 over five, which is, oh, 20, we'll round it up. We'll say 2018, 2018 is my slope. All right. And there we are. So every year, what this says is that every year, 
uh, you gain about 2,000 people in your city. Right. Awesome. So any questions? We'll do more. Uh, and then once we're done with this modeling uh, with linear and exponential, we'll, we'll do a project. So we'll kind of make, kind of mix it up a little. All right. So I'll see you Tuesday. Work on uh, section three homework. I'll post some more up on this line stuff. And uh, yeah, I'll see you Tuesday. Have a nice weekend. Now, we, yeah. All the information that we just did be based on the homework now? Because I know you said last time that we didn't have all of the information and do the homework yet. I think we do now. Okay. I think for homework three, we do. Um, let me know if there's something in there that's weird. Uh, <laughs> yeah, feel free. If, you, if you're doing the homework and somebody doesn't seem right, just shoot me an email and I'll take a look, right? All right. But, okay. Go, <laughs> All right. I'll see you. Thanks. Yeah. Let's see. Stop.